Welcome back to episode three of Outgrowing the Good Christian Girl season three. I am loving this season. Season three is all about a deconstructed life. And today I'm so excited to share my interview with Pastor Trey Ferguson about inviting our imagination into our theology. Those are two words I have never put side by side, imagination and theology. That sounded heretical to me, to be honest, a few years ago. But this episode is incredible. Oh my goodness. So Pastor Trey is a minister, a writer, a speaker. He has an MDiv in theology. He's the author of Theologize and Bigger, Homilies on Living Freely and Loving Holy. And his thoughts on faith in an evolving world can be found on The Three Black Men, Theology, Culture, and the World Around Us, and the New Living Translation podcast. He also has a newsletter. He's got social media at Pastor Trey 5 And if you've ever wondered, how do we figure out the theology that works for our world today and honors God and scripture. How do we change and evolve in the theologies we have? Are we supposed to? This episode is for you. And so today's episode is amazing, but here's one of my favorite blurbs from today's episode. What we understand about God will always be lacking until and unless we can hold space for those who are looking at God from a different angle. Ultimately, mm. deconstruction is about decentering yourself. Wow. Yeah. You are intimately familiar with how you view the world and how you communicate things. Yes. What deconstruction mm. does is says, okay, is there another way of looking at this? Yeah. Yeah. Is there any validity to the ways that other people are encountering the world? Or am I the only person who's been blessed by God with eyes to see things as they truly are? Is it being right about everything something to cling to? Mm. Or can we say, look, I disagree on this with you on this particular issue, but we can agree to disagree because whatever I believe about God, God is bigger than that. Whatever mm. you believe about God, God is bigger than that. I cannot wait to share this whole episode with you. It was so hard to choose just one quote from it. Um, but first, before we get started, a word from our sponsors, BetterHelp. If you've been listening, you know this is coming up because deconstructing your faith is stressful. When you're rethinking what you've taken for granted, asking questions about how to understand scripture, it can feel really overwhelming. The thing that helped me the most on my deconstruction journey was therapy. It gave me space to process my thoughts instead of avoid the discomfort. And it gave me a wise sounding board where I could share my questions and not be afraid of going off the deep end. <laughs> That's where our sponsors better help come in. They will match you with a licensed experienced therapist, usually within 48 hours of signing up. If you'd like a Christian therapist, you can choose that option on the sign up form and then let your therapist know how involved you'd like faith to be in your sessions, if at all. You can meet with your therapist from anywhere in the world because your sessions are all online. And if you don't connect with your first therapist, you can always switch to another. This takes away the headache and stress of trying to line up a therapist on your own. So if you two are deconstructing your faith, check out betterhelp.com slash Tiffany Dawn for 10% off your first month of therapy. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash Tiffany Dawn. Now let's get into today's interview on imagining, using imagination in our theology making with Pastor Trey Ferguson. Pastor Trey, thank you so much for coming on this podcast today. I am so excited to talk with you about our imagination. Imagination is a term that I don't often think of when talking about theology, but you believe we need to use our imagination when developing theology, and I am so excited to hear more about this. So thank you for being here today. I appreciate you having me. I am very passionate about imagination and theology and uh, hopefully we can have some 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 conversations here. Let's do this. Let's do this. I love it. So before we get into imagination itself, let me ask a couple of background questions. I'm starting each interview this season by asking two questions about deconstruction since that's a huge buzzword that means different things to different people. So my first question is what does deconstruction mean to you? Absolutely. It's a great question because I, I think there's a lot of distortion around this. Like we were all using the same language to communicate different things when we use yes. the word deconstruction. And I think that fundamentally that is a, what deconstruction is about, right? Mm -hmm. Deconstruction is an acknowledgement of the fact that words are symbols. We are trying to communicate abstract things in fairly concrete ways anytime we are using language. Mm. And the fact of the matter is that language is not a static thing. 
It evolves mm-hmm. over time and across cultures. And so what deconstruction does, I think, in the classical sense, not necessarily in the contemporary sense that most of us are using, but what we're getting at is what are we actually saying when we use these words? What is the meaning behind these symbols that are coming out as syllables, words, sentences, and paragraphs, right? Mm. Like, At what point did we shift from awful and awesome being synonyms to being antonyms? At Hmm. what point did we shift from terrific and terrified being synonyms to being antonyms, right? Hmm. And how do these shifts in the way that we use language impact the ways that we are communicating truths about the world? And so deconstruction is supposed to be, I think, the examination of how language and shifts in language and our understanding of language impact the ways that we relate to stories and narratives. And Mm -hmm. if there are adjustments that need to be made in our either language or our understanding around these things. Mm. Yeah. I love that, that emphasis on language, because it really is, it really is part of the process for me. Deconstruction, like you were saying with the language has had a lot to do with how I understand the Bible and its intent and all the stories within it. So I want to learn how do I honor the Bible, which also has meant I need to rethink how I understand it and its intent. So I'm also asking each guest, how has your approach to the Bible shifted over the years and why is biblical intent so important to keep in mind as we deconstruct our faith for me the biggest thing that has changed in my relationship with the bible is that i've rehumanized the bible Hmm. and when i say that i'm not saying anything to denigrate the idea of inspiration or the active work of the holy spirit in crafting these scriptures and preserving the truth contained in these scriptures what i'm saying is that the medium that god uses through the holy spirit in sharing these narratives is people Hmm. people like you and me and people who are operating in communities and Hmm. those communities often shape the ways that these stories are told and passed Hmm. down. So when we're talking about language, we have to be very cognizant of the fact that language is a communal inheritance. It is how we communicate things Hmm. within communities. There's a reason that if, you live in the United States of America, we'll communicate a story one way, but if you head into Mexico, they're speaking, they're using different codes to communicate the same truths. Does that Mm -hmm. make sense? Mm -hmm. And so as we reckon with that, and what does that truth say about the Bible? The fact that most Mm -hmm. of us are dealing with the Bible in translation or anything. Oh no, if we reinsert the humanity, we can understand that it's not a bad thing. It's not saying anything bad about God to recognize Mm -hmm. that, oh, Humans also play a role in the way that these stories are told. Yeah. So adding that element in again, um, I think invites me into this process of wrestling with what does it mean Mm. that the eternal, immaterial, transcendent God of the universe, the creator of heaven Mm. and earth, decided to interact with finite, fallible, corruptible human beings like you and me. Yeah. And when I reframe it like that, I actually got way more passionate about the Bible and about digging into Mm. these scriptures when it wasn't just uh, presented to me as like a biography of this God that we could never really understand. And I truly believe that we're still always going to be in the process of understanding God. But when I view it as this library or this anthology of people across ages and cultures and languages and people with different ethical frameworks and everything wrestling with what does it mean that God cares about us Mm. and the ways that we conduct ourselves in the societies that we inhabit. Um, That really encouraged me to stick with the Bible and the stories contained in it. Mm. Yeah, that it really is so awe-inspiring when you think about it that way. And it really has been like, I grew up kind of putting the Bible on like this pedestal of this is just word for word, literally like exactly what we're supposed to live our lives. And like, it just, it didn't leave a lot of room for considering the human element that was intended to be there, I believe. And yeah, it really is amazing to look at it that way. So in As we begin this um, interview with you, I want to get to your book pretty quickly and the idea of imagination. But I was wondering, would you share with us just a little bit about what your life and faith were like growing up and 
how your faith has evolved over the years and, and why that process began? That's a great question. And I grew up in church, in and around church. One of the people mm. who was in church multiple times a week. I'm a product of the black church tradition. Mm. And at the same time, when I came into adolescence, like a whole lot of people, I was very curious about the things of the world, as they would say in church language, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, for a time, <laughs> I, I walked away from the church, not in declaring any any level of disbelief or anything. I was just like, oh, if I don't have to be here four days a week, I'm going to find something right. else to do with my time, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot it, of time, too, four <laughs> yeah, days a week. Yeah. And, and, and uh, when it came time to go to college, I, I did not entertain the thought of going to Bible college or anything of this sort. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to experience the world. So I, I went to a very secular uh, college in a pretty metropolitan area. And I was confronted with a lot of people who not only didn't believe the things that I believed, but found some of them to be kind of absurd or silly. Mm -hmm. And it's not as though I was ignorant about the, the presence or existence of agnostics and atheists before, but people who were just like very comfortable questioning like, yo, does this make sense? And, and things like that. And so even as I still held these beliefs, um, I was confronted with other world views, people who, who mm -hmm. I considered friends and everything, who, who mm -hmm. lived what could reasonably considered reasonably be considered moral lives and things of that nature who just didn't see things the same way and it caused me to re-examine the beliefs i held hmm. and how i came to hold these beliefs now i didn't discard everything but mm -hmm. what it did was help me to see things in higher definition right mm -hmm. where i saw some things more fuzzily before re-examining them made me coloring the lines a little, a little bit better and, and things yeah. of that nature and find out what, what things I needed to leave behind. What is actually superstition parading uh, under the guise of, of, of biblical religion and, 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 oh, yeah. and whatnot, right? Um, and so that was me through young adulthood until I came into this place with, uh, I met this woman in college who I, I eventually married. She didn't grow up oh. in church like I did. And, um, but she was really curious about religion. She asked me to go to church with her. And I got plugged into a couple of communities that didn't make me feel bad for having questions. Hmm. Um, and in that process, I started, uh, it started with like youth ministry and, and things of that nature. And I kind of just grew into the pastor trade that we see today. It was a bit of a circuitous route, but I've enjoyed almost every moment of it because at no point did I feel as though God thought less of me. Or maybe I did at some points feel that way. But now looking back, I recognize that God was there the whole time. Mm, that's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. Now, would you tell us a little bit about your book, Theolo Theologizing have a hard time saying theology words. Theologize and bigger. What does that title mean to you? Can you tell us about the main idea of your book? And then we're going to kind of dive into theology and imagination. Most definitely. The main idea of the book is that if we are to love as God desires us to, and if we are to live as freely as God desires us to, then we will have to think bigger thoughts about God. Hmm regularly, continuously, that is a commitment that we will have to make, thinking bigger thoughts about God. Whatever we have inherited about God, as true as it may be, is not the fullness of who God is and what God mm. is like. That's the main idea. Now, the word theologize, and it's just the, it's the word I put to thinking thoughts about God, because mm. when it comes to being a theologian, that word is intimidating for a lot of people. It seems like oh, we have yeah. to go through a whole lot of studying and things of that nature. and. Sure, maybe there's merit to that. But I think that at the end of the day, everybody is thinking thoughts about God. Um, even if you are an agnostic or a skeptic or whatever, um, mm -hmm. you might not believe in God, but you've thought enough thoughts to be like, that doesn't make sense. You've done theologizing, even if it's led you away from theism, right? Wow, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so my, my whole argument here is that uh, theologizing bigger, thinking bigger thoughts about God um, is actually not just a path, but the path to understanding more about who God is, what mm. God is like, and becoming more of who God has called you to be. Mm. I love that. Let's talk about theology, that which totally can sound so intimidating, like a lot of hoops to jump through. Yeah. Um, how have we understood theology 
through church history and then in recent years in more specifically like the Western evangelical church, in your opinion, what are some ways in which we've misunderstood what theology is meant to be? And what are some things we've done well? So one thing that I think the church has historically done well Mm. is understanding the power of story. Hmm. Before we had systematic theologies, we had narratives. And some of those narratives would weave different threads of Scripture, different parts of Scripture together. And a lot of that is now manifested as what we know as systematic theology. And I think that Mm -hmm. there is sometimes that that is a a bit of an overcorrection or a bit of a misstep. When we think that we can break God down into these steps. And if you understand these steps Mm -hmm. or these ideas, then we understand God. I think that's a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the blessings and the curses of the past five and a half centuries of Christian history it's the invention of the Gutenberg printing press, which made the Bible more readily accessible and available to us. Mm-hmm. And so this idea that uh, the Bible is the central means of our faith was mm-hmm. virtually impossible for the majority of Christian history, right? What we yeah. had was the rites and the rituals and the narratives that we could share, regardless of whether or not you own a copy of the Bible, because for most mm-hmm. of Christian history and still today in large parts of the world, people cannot own like physical copies of the Bible like that. Right. And so the means of practicing this Christian faith had to look like something other than personal Bible study and being able to proof text people to death. It's Mm. a very narrow way of viewing Christianity, thinking that everything is contained in these books. No, this book is Mm. important to us, but it literally cannot be the only way because for most of Christian history and indeed for large parts of of the Christian world today, that's not a thing that people can do. Right. right. Um, and that's one of the things. So there's this stereotype that some people hold about Catholics or, oh, they're not in the Bible like they should be. And I'm like, well, because most of their history, they literally could not be in the Bible <laughs> like you want them to. Cause they, right. The, the technology did not exist. And even when the technology first came about, it was very expensive. And so the way that mm-hmm. you came to know the Bible is by going to church or going to these gatherings and sharing these stories and and repeating these narratives. Mm. And so all that to say, the idea of theology is this thing that can be broken down systematically and, and learned by reading the right Calvin books and and things of that nature is I think a bit of a recency bias. Mm. Um, Theology historically has been done and worked out in community, even if, by consensus and it's another thing what we recognize as orthodox theology is inherently political Hmm. Um, and i don't mean that in a partisan way but i'm talking about if you have the emperor of 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 of, uh of a kingdom convening councils of bishops to determine what is in and out of bounds then we can't Hmm. like separate that from power Uh, Hmm. but at the end of the day what we're dealing with is a communal wrestling with what we believe about God. Hmm. And nowadays, yeah, yeah, we have this idea that the only things we need to know about God are are coming from the Bible when historically that, that really hasn't been the case in that, in that way. Wow. That's so important for us to be aware of. And I think in, well, for, for me, you know, like growing up conservative Christianity in the United States of America, like, everything was like you were saying about the Bible, like you have your daily Bible time, like you have to, everything comes from scripture. It is like almost like put on this pedestal again. And like you said, it's important, but there's more. That's just so important for us to be aware of. Can let's dive into this idea of imagination. Now, what is the biblical and historical precedent for involving our imagination in theology? So the biblical precedent for involving your imagination in theology, I think comes from Genesis Mm. chapters one and two. We talk about the very act of creation. Mm. Uh, First and foremost, there's this logical problem with the way that some of us view the Bible is this eyewitness account. Like if we read the the creation account in Genesis, it's literally impossible for that to be an eyewitness account Mm. uh, because- yeah. The man <laughs> right, was it, not made. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. Right. And so like we have this idea of divine revelation. Cool. I don't have a problem with that at all. 
But mm. what that means is that something that you did not witness with your own eyes came mm -hmm. somehow into your realm of knowing. Mm. And my argument here is that what we have there is this power of imagination. We can construct mm. an image of something that we have not seen. Mm. It's what I'm talking about when it comes to imagination. Now, furthermore, my argument is that when it says that we are made in the image of God, what is actually being communicated is that we have that power of imagination. God mm. calls the things that are not in uh, that that are not into being. Hmm. That's how creation occurs. God sees something. God sees something that is not yet, and then calls that thing that is not yet into being. Yeah, and, and, and then we are made in the image of God. Jesus says later on that greater works than these shall you do. And so if we can imagine something, if we can construct a reality in our minds that is not yet, then we can call that into being on earth as it is in heaven. I think that that is what it means to mm. follow Jesus. That is the faith that we have. It's the evidence of things hoped for, the substance mm. of things unseen, right? Yeah. Imagination is critical to what it means to pursue the kingdom of God. Mm, I love that. I'd never th thought about those verses in that light, but that totally makes sense. And I, th oh, go ahead. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is because when we say the word imagination, it sounds like a childish endeavor. If I call yes. something imaginary, it sounds like an insult. But if you yes. look at what the word is, like an image, do you have the power to construct an image? And is the spirit mm. of God strong enough to bring that image into being? And so I mm. get why, like, we don't think about it in those terms. But I think that that might be a misstep on our part. Yeah. Yeah. And that thinking of imagination like an image, I love that. Now, I heard in one of the podcast interviews you did that you were talking about how Pentecost teaches us about theology. Um, can you talk about that? Absolutely. So when I look at deconstruction as an endeavor in examining the ways that we use language, what we have to wrestle with is the fact that we are limited by language. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that the Holy Spirit does in Pentecost is overcome our human limitations as far as language goes. Mm -hmm. where people who did not know other languages were empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit to communicate the truth of God in other languages. Hmm. I am monolingual. Like I only speak one language. I, I went to seminary. I, have, I had to wrestle with the scriptures in their original languages. I, I yeah. didn't have to pass classes, right? Yeah. I'm not that good. <laughs> I, I still learn other people for that, right? I live in Miami. Uh, there are all of the public notices are posted in three languages here. We got English, Spanish, and Creole, Haitian Creole. Um, I can only speak one of those languages, yeah. <laughs> but I've been around enough people to understand that there are no one to one equivalents in languages mm. because what we're trying to do is communicate ideas. Sometimes there has to be a little bit of wrestling. Mm. And so if in English, the scripture, uh, John 1, 1 says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And the word is an English translation of the concept of logos, right? In mm. Spanish, that same scripture is re rendered. In el principio era el verbo, right? In the beginning was the verb. In the beginning was the action. It's communicating the mm. very same thing using a different concept. Yeah. But the Holy Spirit is in all of that, right? What does it mean if Jesus is the bread of life if you are in a community that does not eat bread? Is mm. Jesus then the sweet potato of life or the life <laughs> of life? What, right. What, what happens in that? And so what I say uh, Pentecost teaches us about theology is the fact that theology is an inherently incarnational endeavor wherein mm. we try to take this transcendent and, and incorruptible immortal God and communicate in ways that only finite corruptible humans can do. And so mm. it has to be active because the language that like even the English I speak right here in South Florida is different than somebody speaking in, in, in Nebraska is going to say, right? Mm -hmm. They go to a restaurant, they ask for pop. If you come over here and ask for pop, people are going to look at you crazy. We yeah. speak the same language, <laughs> different dialects. But God has to be able to be known in all of those, right? Mm. And what that is telling us is that where we find ourselves as human beings is important in how we understand God in some way, shape, or form. Hmm. Yeah, that's so good. 
would you tell us about, so I know, and you wrote that, I believe I'm saying this right, that many things we now believe were given to us by people who are once considered heretics, which is so important to remember as we're in this deconstruction process. Would you tell us more about this and why imagination and um, especially in theology making has a long history in church history and theology? Yeah. One of the quotes that I include in the book is by Bishop Yvette Flunder, who says that the only difference between a heretic and a prophet is time. Hmm. Wow. I think it's important for us to reckon with that because the idea that God could be made known in a human being like Jesus Christ Mm. is still viewed as a heretical idea by practicing Jewish people. Hmm. And there is a reason that what was once viewed as a Jewish messianic sect is now regarded as a different religion by just about every practicing Jewish person. The one uh, exception would be what is known as messianic Jew, uh, Jewish people. And it's worth noting that the majority of Jewish people across the spectrum, whether we're talking about Orthodox Jews, Uh, whether we're talking about conservative Jewish people, whether we're talking about reformed Jewish people, do not regard Messianic Jewish people as Jewish people Mm. (laughs) because in their mind Mm. that that is heretical. Like, no, you guys are talking about something different at this point. And Mm. I have Jewish friends like me in in our minds. You guys are polytheists at this point. That that, that's no Mm. longer monotheism. Wow. I say that not to argue the merits of this theology, but what we have to reckon with is the fact that the, Origins of our faith and all of our our creeds and our faith declarations are heterodox to the inheritance Hmm. that that we have, right? There are people who believe, I'm not one of them, who believe that Christianity is a continuation or a completion of Judaism. But Hmm. according to the claims of Judaism, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. A lot of what we say is viewed as a heresy by that standard. Hmm. Now, what I believe about Christianity is that we are a reinterpretation of some of those tenets of Judaism. Hmm. Um, And I don't have any problem saying or owning that. But what we believe about God and about Jesus got us put out of a lot of faith communities. Well, not Hmm. just would have. They they did that. That's the heart of of a schism right there. Hmm. And that's not to to comment on their validity or lack thereof. It, It just is what it is. Hmm. And the other thing that we have to wrestle with is that the idea of an orthodoxy, one single orthodoxy took time to come about and did not happen in a vacuum. It was Hmm. largely a byproduct of political expediency. And Hmm. so if our main fear is making sure that we don't step on any toes, then we might miss the opportunity to follow Jesus wherever he is leading. Hmm. Because sometimes Jesus might be leading you away from whatever the orthodox or proper or safe belief is. Hmm. Because yeah. whatever tradition we've inherited is not large enough to contain the truth and fullness of who God is. Hmm. Can you talk more about that? I think that this is like one of our biggest fears. I, I as we enter the deconstruction, you know, thinking through our faith, theologize and bigger, like, can you talk more about that? And also that idea of orthodoxy being tied to political power. I had never thought of that before. Yeah. So, okay. There's two questions in there, right? Um, Yeah, that's true. There are. (laughs) Let me start with the orthodoxy one. Um, Orthodoxy is religious or ecclesial consensus building, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) <laughs> the, the the people who had uh, uh, orthodoxy is as much a matter of thus saith a sufficient amount of people who are empowered to speak for religious communities as mm. it is thus saith the Lord. Hmm. The, the first Christian orthodox statements, like we look at the Nicene Creed, that, that was convened by the emperor, like <laughs> Constantine called that convention, because at hmm. a certain point, somebody recognized it as we are expanding or as we are trying to shore up our administration, it actually behooves us to have something resembling a uniform religion. That's why even Hmm. as people were reforming the church, the the Catholic church, that the vast majority of those reformers still worked within the framework of state churches. 
Hmm. The church and the state were very closely aligned because there was a, the, the main exception would be the radical reformers, people who now recognize as Anabaptists, like the Mennonites, the Amish, and things of those natures, uh, hmm. where, where they deliberately uh, separated from like, civic power. Like they, there, hmm. there was a separation there um, in some sense. But apart from that, we have to recognize that the church, or what we now recognize as the church and the state, worked in tandem and deliberately so this idea that the church and state are separated was a novel concept when it Hmm. came to the americas and even so i don't think that they were that clean about it right Hmm. even if you look at american history it was at the federal level that that separation was supposed to exist there were lots of states that had pretty close affiliations between or lots of colonies where the affiliation between the the state or the colony and the church was pretty strong Hmm. And so what we have to recognize is that a lot of times when we are reading our modern concepts of separation of church and state, and that that's, that's a misreading of what has been happening previously. The idea hmm. that those things were separate at all um, didn't make sense for most of history. Hmm. And so even as we're reading the Gospels, when we look at whatever hostility existed between Jesus and certain religious leaders, even labeling them religious leaders is a bit of a misnomer because a lot of the people who held religious authority also held civic authority. Hmm. Right. The Jerusalem Temple wasn't just a place of religious significance. It was basically the capital, hmm. <laughs> the, the capital city of of Judea, the, the Roman province of Judea at, at, at a certain point. Yeah. And so um, when we are reconstructing not only the biblical landscape, but the historical landscape, it's important to recognize that theology is also an endeavor of communicating truth and that there was not much of a separation between truth about God and truth about the world around us, including the civic world. Hmm. Now, when it comes to like imagining things and, and sometimes having to go against the predominant orthodoxy. Yeah. What I'm saying here is if there is any possibility that the state can be wrong about something or wrong in administering justice in the way that it does, then that means that some of the theology that has been co-signed by that state might also be deficient in some areas. Hmm. And if that is the case, then we have to be willing if confronted with the idea that I believe that God is bigger than this and calling me away from this, but this is what is the consensus. This is our our, head, our orthodox thinking in this area. If, if I'm confronted with that choice, do I choose the safety of orthodoxy or do I choose mm. the largeness of God? Hmm. Right. <laughs> and if choosing That's so hard, yeah, right, right, right. If choosing the largeness of God becomes a practice of yours, you will be condemned as heterodox. You will be called a heretic. That's, that's coming for you. Like, it's going to happen. Oh. Yeah. I think, like, there's this fear of getting it wrong. How do we, and I think orthodoxy is, like, a safe place. Like, well, here, I know I'm in, I'm in this. How do you navigate that? How do you know if you're getting it wrong? Does it not matter as much as we thought it did? Like, how do we know we're following God if we're feeling like we're more off on our own. Does that make sense? Right. The answer to that question in short is by faith, right? Mm. If we look at the example of Abraham, regarded Mm. by many as the father of faith, Abraham lived in safety in Haran. It was well-established at this point. Um, And God calls Abram at that time away from that safety Mm. to a a land that I will show you. He doesn't even know where Mm. he's going. He just knows that, that God a guy that people around him didn't even know uh, Mm, was calling him to this unfamiliar place Mm. where his blessing and where his promise resided. Mm. How does Abram know that where he's going is, is a blessed place where his descendants will find favor and promise and identity and all of these things by faith. There's nothing Mm. logical about it. There's no safeguard. There's no safety rail that says, Oh no, it's okay to go this way unless you believe and the, the largeness and the good character, the incorruptible character of the God who is calling you to this place. Hmm. Hmm. And so when we're confronted with that in a modern context, if we can recognize 
an injustice or some barrier to wholeness in something that exists and that mm-hmm. something that exists is within the bounds of orthodox thinking hmm. and we are faithful enough to the idea that God is bigger than this and that God is indeed good hmm. then okay some people might think that I've, I've, I'm on a slippery slope or whatever but I'm going to follow God I'm, hmm. I'm going to follow God right there because yeah. there's certain the, the whole idea of chattel sl- slavery in the United States was perfectly orthodox mm. mm-hmm. and there were some people who were like, ah, I don't know. I, I think that God might be calling us beyond this to the mm-hmm. point where people who believed in not only the permissibility, but the rightness of the institution of slavery, they went and started new denominations. You guys are going, uh, you're getting too liberal mm-hmm. with this thing right here and all these things. And, and, and what integrity and courage demand of us is even if the path has not been charted before us, that we will follow God in the mm. uncharted places. That's the example that Abram sets for us. Mm. Uh, we'll leave yeah. the places of comfort and safety to follow God to the place where we believe that the blessing and the promise resides. Hmm. Yeah. And it's almost like having the faith that we are following God and that he will keep us even when it's like, am I doing the right thing? Am I really following you right now? Absolutely. Because if we go back to that, that Bishop Yvette Flunder quote, it's not until there's been enough time passed yeah. that we can see the vindication of the truth. Uh, yeah. It's also the test that the Bible itself gives for prophets. Oh, you can tell a false prophet because their words do not come to pass, which means mm. that time, this irreversible force that we have where these dramas unfold is a necessary judge for the rightness or wrongness of any claim mm. about God. Hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. I think for many of us, there's this idea that theology is a place we've already arrived, not a journey we're still on. And I know you talk about this. Can you can you talk more about that idea? One of the things we have to wrestle with is the fact that the universe is still expanding. Hmm. And if God is the author of the universe and all that there is. If we build monuments for God instead of movements for God, we risk losing Mm. track of God as the universe unfolds. Mm. So what makes sense to us today, perfect sense of of everything that we have right now, will necessarily be obsolete by tomorrow because the story of the universe is still unfolding before Mm. us. If your theology is fixed, you may be right for a moment. Mm. But Jesus's command is not learn about where I was. It is Mm. to take up your cross and follow me. Mm. Christ is yet moving in front of us, right? The story Mm. is still unfolding. And so I think as we engender a certain level of not only humility, but wonder, Mm. not only about what God has done, but about what God is doing. Mm then the idea that theology is an active endeavor Hmm. and we're not just learning about the the things of the past, but we're, we're wrestling with what's happening right now and what is still yet to come because yes, we are, we are amazed by what God has already done, Mm -hmm. but our hope is never just in what God has done. It is about what lies ahead. Hmm. And so yeah. when we think about that, I think it's um, a little easier to stomach the idea that, oh, this this theology thing, this w- whatever we're wrestling with, is something that we don't ever have to stop doing. Hmm. Yeah. And I think there can be this almost this concern of like, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. So our theology should be as well. Can you speak to that? Like help us understand that better? Absolutely. The idea that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever is true. Hmm. But what was Jesus like yesterday? Hmm. If God identifies as I am who I am, I will be who I will be. What God is saying is as powerful and as loving and as wonderful as I was yesterday, I'm that way today. You can count on me being that way tomorrow. Hmm. That's not 
Jesus claiming to be a statue that, that we can mm. uh, take enough laps around and understand in fullness. It's like, you can count on my character. You can count on me mm. being who I am. But the moment you feel like you have whoever that is figured out is the mm. moment that you have crafted an idol. Wow. That's powerful because that is what we do with a lot of our theologies when you say it that way. Yes. Yeah, it is. And one of the things that's important, you know, because I, I do all this talk and I write, I write this book, I write the little newsletter and everything. I don't do that because I have things figured out. One of the reasons that the newsletter is called The Sun Do Move is because I am always in the process of trying to not even to figure out, to learn, to, to follow mm -hmm. wherever God is leading. The mm -hmm. reason that the book is called Theologizing Bigger instead of Theologized Bigger is mm -hmm. because this is an ongoing process, an ongoing commitment to a God who is still writing the story in front of us. Hmm. Yeah. I love that. So what does it look like practically to invite our imagination into our theology and to rethink some things that maybe we're like, I don't think this theology is right or God honoring or reflecting God's character. How, what does that look like practically for us? I think one of the larger mishaps with the, the Protestant Reformation was uh, the skepticism or outright antagonism that we brought uh, to all things Catholic or, or papist, including many mm. contemplative practices that mm. were actually fruitful. And yeah. so one of the things that I've had to reincorporate into my faith journey is the practice of meditation, mm. just sitting in silence with God. Um, and whether that's a meditation where I'm, I'm literally just tuned into to things around me, like I'll, I'll sit in silence for 10 minutes and, and hear the cars going by like outside mm. the block and things of that nature. And then there are times where I think about um, in meditation, certain narratives and, and arcs of scripture and the stories of God and the things that we believe and communicate about God. And in those moments, when I sit in reflection about the character and the truth of God, um, some things become fuzzier for me and some things become clearer for me. Mm. And, so when we talk about in practice, like what does this stuff mean? Mm. In practice, we have to learn to be uncomfortable hmm. with the very idea of God. Hmm. I think that there is a danger in growing so comfortable with God that we no longer feel compelled to commit to the process of transformation. Hmm when God becomes the standard by which we judge everybody else because we are consumed or we are, we are convinced that we are already marching in lockstep with God at every step. I think we have lost the plot. And so the practical thing here um, is using the Bible in particular and our faith in general as a mirror hmm. where we can look and see, Oh, these are the areas where I still need to commit to becoming the person that God has called me to be. Hmm. Um, these are the areas where I see the communities of which I am a part falling short and caring for the least of these. Hmm. These are the areas where the salvation of God made known in the person of Jesus Christ and his life, burial, resurrection, and all those things. The, these are the areas where that truth needs to be brought to bear and not just in an evangelistic commitment, but in an incarnational uh, hmm. endeavor where, where I am going to make the character of Jesus known, even if people don't want to hear the message of Jesus. Hmm. So practically it, it means that we take the gospel seriously, hmm. right? When we wrestle with the idea of what does it mean that a God who the Bible itself says nobody has ever seen mm. was revealed in a person. Yeah. What does it mean that that person invites us into that story by saying, um, whenever you partake of this ritual, right? In communion, like you are remembering me, you, you are putting my body back together in your presence. And then yeah. he says the greater works than these shall you do. When, when Jesus dies, not just 
instead of, but ahead of us and invites us into the resurrection, into these glorified bodies. Like, what does that mean? And so Hmm. when I bring in all these things about the contemplative practice and everything, I legitimately every single day spend time wrestling with what does it mean that this eternal, invisible God was revealed in a human body, in a Hmm. human community, in such a way that thousands of years later, people are still calling on that same name. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And it, it's true. Like we, there are so many deep and rich spiritual practices that we've kind of written off and need to kind of explore again. Do you have, are there resources you know of for people who want to learn about and integrate some of those different practices into their lives? I know throwing this question on you on the spot. If you think of them too, I can always link them in the show notes later. So there are a few devotionals that I think are helpful in this regard. Most of them are written by women, which I think is dope. Um, Mm. Because I don't know if women of faith have ever had the luxury of putting aside contemplative practices. Mm. Um, And so I would recommend The Wild Land Within by uh, Lisa Colon DeLay. I would recognize Sacred Belonging or recommend Sacred Belonging by Kat Armas. I would recommend Sacred Self-Care by Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Uh, Shaniqua Walker Barnes. And um, yeah, anytime we can lean into the perspective of somebody who didn't come by this faith the same way that we did, but still Mm -hmm. uh, exemplifies a love for not only all things divine, but the person of Jesus, I, I think mm-hmm. that there's a lot to glean from them about how, how do you hold on to this faith in this uh, wild world mm-hmm. of ours? You know? I love that. Wow. Thank you. I have just a couple more questions for you as we start to wrap things up. When it comes to controversial issues where many Christians disagree on the quote unquote right theology, Can we come to different conclusions? And what does that teach us about God? And how can we learn about God through our disagreements? Again, three questions in one, as I always do. (laughs) Yeah, I think we have almost 2,000 years of evidence to suggest that we can come to different conclusions. Mm -hmm. Whether people are okay agreeing or disagree is another thing entirely, Mm -hmm. but the disagreements are always going to be there, right? True. Um, And and so what does that tell us about God is that uh, what we understand about God will always be lacking until and Mm -hmm. unless we can hold space for those who are looking at God from a different angle. Hmm. At the top of this conversation, you asked me what deconstruction meant to me. And I mentioned a whole lot about language, but ultimately Mm -hmm. deconstruction is about decentering yourself. Wow. Yeah intimately familiar with how you view the world and how you communicate things. Yes. What deconstruction Mm -hmm. does is says, okay, is there another way of looking at this? Yeah. Yeah. Is there any validity to the ways that other people are encountering the world? Or am I the only person who's been blessed by God with eyes to see things as they truly are? (laughs) (laughs) Yup. Well said. (laughs) And, And so I think one of the things when it comes to disagreement, that we can learn about God is when God is revealed in Jesus that shows us that God is someone who cherishes the idea of humility. And that that's clearly mm-hmm. communicated, uh, most clearly yeah. communicated in Philippians two, where it says that God uh, being equivalent with God, he didn't think of that as something to cling to and, and took on the humble uh, position of a slave, even to the mm-hmm. point of death on the cross. And all yeah. these things. If that is what God is willing to show you in the person of Jesus Christ, then are we really willing to die on all of these little hills to prove how right we are? Hmm. Is, is is equality with God something to cling to? Is it being right about everything something to cling to? Hmm. Or can we say, look, I disagree on this with you on this particular issue, but we can agree to disagree because whatever I believe about God, God is bigger than that. Whatever hmm. you believe about God, God is bigger than that. Hmm. And, and so can we agree that God is good, that God mm-hmm. is loving, that God is merciful, that God is just, mm-hmm. and that in the end, God wins. Mm. Yeah, that's huge. And being okay with not having to 
have everyone on the same page with every issue and just trust that God is working like God is with them on the journey and they can take their journey and it can look different than yours. That's been a big thing of what I've been learning because I used to be a very know-it-all Christian. (laughs) And and certainty feels good in some instances, but Mm. when you think about it, certainty and faith are not good bedfellows. Hmm. That's a good point. As we start to wrap up this interview, I could ask you more questions all day long, but um, I do have just the final ones. Um, First, let's go to a bird's eye view again. Part of deconstruction is asking, as you mentioned earlier too, what parts of my faith do I bring forward with me and what parts do I leave behind? So I'm asking all my guests, do you have any examples of this in your own life that you'd feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, the subtitle of my book, Theologizing Bigger, is Homilies on Living Freely and Loving Holy. And originally, the subtitle I was going to go with was Homilies That Help Lead Us to Wholeness. Hmm. Because what I've had to wrestle with is the idea of 1 John chapter 4. Nobody has ever seen God. Hmm. And he goes on to say that God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God. What is hmm. Love. What do we mean when we say that? Mm. My pastor and my mentor, he defines, he says that the biblical definition of love is the giving of all that one is, has, and does for the positive benefit of another, expecting nothing in return. Wow. And when you run the gospel through that rubric, it, it kind of clicks and it makes sense. Mm. There's a whole lot of words in that definition. So I wanted something shorter. <laughs> and uh, I looked at it and I said, I said, I think that love is the commitment to wholeness. Hmm. And so now the rubric that I run everything through when I'm looking at what do I bring with me and what do I leave behind is, does this lead to wholeness? Hmm. Are communities restored in this idea about God and this practice of God? Are relationships restored? Are people Hmm. brought more into the fullness? Can, Can people see themselves as God does through this? Or are they stuck with, uh, the limitations of own, their own negative thoughts or, or the expectations that other people put on them. Hmm. What would a commitment to wholeness look like and demand of us in this situation? And I think that's something we even see borne out in scripture hmm. where Jesus rubs some of his contemporaries the wrong ways. Like, no, this is our custom here. This, this We don't do this on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, well, is the Sabbath the time to do good or to do evil? Hmm. To, to heal or to harm people. Yeah. And when when questions are brought to him, I think what Jesus often asks is what does wholeness, restoration, reconciliation, what does atonement look like and, and demand of us in this situation? Mm-hmm. And so when I'm looking at things to leave behind, certain ways of thinking, even if I believe that, oh, this is what the righteousness of God demands. I'm like, okay, that sounds good. But in practice, hmm. Is that leading people to wholeness? Because some of the stuff we have data on, there are certain yeah. ideas where we can see depression rising. We can see mm-hmm. people dying by suicide rising. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a correlation between that. Oh, no, that does not lead to wholeness. I have to leave that behind. Yeah. Because I love yeah. you more than I love you more than I love being right. I love mm. you because God has called me to love you. God didn't call me to be right. God called us to wear the righteousness of Jesus. Mm. You know? Yeah. That's so good. I love that. It's it kind of reminds me of who's the um the lady who says, "Hold your possessions and if they bring you joy, keep them and if they don't, let them go." I forget the word for it, but it reminds me of that like, "Hold these theologies and if they bring wholeness, keep them and if they don't, let them go." Yes. <laughs> like Yes, that's yeah. right. uh, one of the quotes at the front of my books from James Baldwin who says that if the concept of God has any validity or any use, it can only be to make us larger, more freer, and more loving. And if it can't do that, then it's time that we got rid of them. And I believe mm. that wholeheartedly. Mm. Yeah, that's so good. You have a ton of resources for people trying to navigate faith and theology and deconstruction and all this stuff. Can you tell us about your resources and where my listeners can find you? Most definitely. I uh, am the author of Theologizing Bigger, Homilies on Living Freely, Loving Holy, of course. You can Which find you should all get. You, yes, yes, you should. Uh-huh. You, know, you can find that wherever you get your books. But I'm also, I, I have a newsletter uh, 
called the Sundu Move, where I'll mm-hmm. write random um, musings about uh, faith or my life, lots of different things. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff for free on there. There's a paid subscription where you get a little more content as well. It's mm-hmm. on um, Substack. You can find, matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, we can find all this stuff in just a moment. Um, awesome. I co-host th- the Three Black Men podcast with my, my brothers, Sam Gay and Rob Monson. I also co-host, uh, no, not co-host. I just singularly host. It's just me. <laughs> the, New <laughs> Living, the New Living Translation podcast. Uh, we do Bonafide Bible Talk with yours truly. I love all of that. those things and all of my social media handles can be found at pastortray05.com. That's pastortray05.com. You can find the link to buy my books. You can find the podcast. You can find the newsletter. All of that stuff, pastortray05.com. And Trey is T R E Y. Yes. A Y. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Good, good catch. Good Perfect. Catch. Yeah. Ah, oh, I know. We, my daughter's names. I'm always like, nope, it's this way because otherwise we'll never find it. So, <laughs> yeah. But oh, thank you so much for being here today. And to all my listeners, I'll see you next week for another episode about growing the good Christian girl.